There you go. Evan, Marty, we haven't worked together before, but you're coming from C4. Highly recommended. It's great to work with you. I am Gary. I represent the marketing team in our weekly webinar series uh, for all the SNAP One locals, and that's MRI, that's Custom Plus, it's all net, and it's a volume tone. So you're basically speaking to the nation here. There's my intro for you. Give it up for Evan, everybody. Thank you. Hey. Fantastic. Thank you. So um, anyway, so I apologize for the, the technical problems that we had. But anyway, we'll jump right in. Um, I'll start with giving you guys a little bit of background about myself. I think it'll probably help help you guys understand about some of the direction and some of the ideas that we have around Oversee, uh, what we're introducing and kind of how what the roadmap looks like going forward. So I'm excited to talk about this stuff with you guys today. Um, but anyway, so so my background is um, I was an integrator myself. I spent uh, 20 years as an integrator uh, lo located in Aspen, Colorado. Um, I started a small company uh, doing doing you know large homes there. It was uh, it was it was a group of four of us. Um, I was you know I was one of the one of the early guys. We grew that company up to be 400. It was actually the largest integration company in the country. Um, and uh, as as that uh, as that effort was failing, I actually jumped out of the integrator side and went to the manufacturer side. I actually went to work for uh, Ahiji. If you guys have been in the business long enough, um, Ahiji is a product that's been around for roughly 12 years. Uh, and it was really the first introduction into remote monitoring and management uh, into the CDS space or into the smart home space. Um, the reason I jumped there is because I had uh, it relied heavily on a Hiji in in a lot of our larger products we or projects we were doing very large projects really all over the world um there were there was boats and yachts and and islands and and villas and estates and ski ski chalets and, and really all over so um we really relied on on remote monitoring to be successful to provide the level of service that our customers our very wealthy customers are expecting um so i made the transition to Ahiji. Um, based on a lot of the things that I had learned um, dealing with with high end clientele, and, and 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 you guys know this that that this business is really about service. Um, selling a TV is not the basis of what we do. Selling speakers is not the basis of what we do. Making the magic happen, making the magic work, and then making it continually work, and 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 servicing these customers. That's really what builds your brand. And so my belief in this whole thing and really where we were successful is providing fantastic customer service, um, both remotely and in person when necessary. But really my mantra when I'm as a product manager for, for this product is really, I don't want to put anybody inside of a, a house unless they know what they're there to do and they have the parts and tools and knowledge to be successful in the first visit. And that really comes from an experience that I have around service calls basically being two visits, right? The first one is what I call diagnostics and discovery, where you walk into a house and the customer's like, I don't have any center channel in my, in my theater. Um, that's definitely an in-person call. Like there's not much that remote management can do for you today to solve a problem like that. So when you look at that, you're going to walk in and you go, huh, there's no sound, there's no center, there's no center channel. And you, your technician may or may not have the experience to know what, what, how to troubleshoot this thing or whatever. Um, it may be a failed component. It may be a damaged wire. It may be a damaged speaker. Whatever it is, I don't know what it's going to be. But you're going to go on site for the first trip and you're going to go, huh, I need some parts or I don't know how to fix this and somebody else needs to come help me. And then you leave and you come back either you know, hours later, days later, weeks later, whatever it is, depending on what the needs are you'll come back and the second trip is typically repair and recovery. So the first trip is diagnostics and discovery. The second trip is repair and recovery. Typically what we saw is only one of those visits is billable. Um, and so my, my effort is like, how do I, first of all, prevent a service trip? Um, and, and if there is one, it, it's only one, it's limited to only one and it's not multiple. So, what we're looking to do with Oversee is, is empower you guys with the ability and the knowledge to say, hey, I understand what this is, so I'll, I'll continue forward with my center channel mismatch or my, my no center channel audio. I think I just gave away the punchline. Um, anyway, so I'll use that one. Well, it very easily could be something as simple as, as an as a audio format mismatch, right? Like you've got a, 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 a 4K video source playing a playing a movie that's Dolby Atmos, and your surround receiver may not be configured to receive that that type of audio. So it's going to push it to PCM two channel audio, 
you have no center channel audio. It's a very simple fix. And actually it's one that you could generally do remotely. So using Oversee, we can log in and pull up the local UI of the, of the AVR and, and resolve that issue remotely. Now, if it was something like I said, a damaged speaker, a damaged, damaged wire, whatever, um, secondarily, I could be like, ah, I know it's not that. I know it's probably, it looks like everything is you know, like, everything else is working right. It's down, narrowed down just the center channel speaker. I'm going to go and I'm going to walk in the site and I'm going to go exactly to that center channel speaker and start troubleshooting. There's not a whole lot of things that, that are necessary, but the idea is that we've armed you with information to be successful when you go to that job site. So anyway, that's the idea behind Oversee. That's kind of some of my experience and really, you know, that mantra that I say is I don't ever want to put somebody inside of a house that doesn't have the knowledge, the skills, and the tools to be successful in a single visit. So that's kind of the on-site thing. Now, building out to how do we do this remotely, um, that's the monitoring side of it. Oversee is significantly more than that. Oversee is, is really a lot of configuration. You'll, you're, you're starting to see more and more configuration capabilities get delivered inside of of Oversee, I think it started with a WAP box, like configuring the outlets, labeling the outlets, doing the schedules and the ping tests and, and auto reboots, the, the healing capabilities. WAP box is phenomenal. Now we're looking to expand that. Like the next thing you saw was Wi-Fi management, bringing in Wi-Fi management so that you could easily configure multiple access points with, with very few clicks and in a single pane of glass was something that we released last October. I think Derek went through all of that stuff. Now, building on what we released this last week, um, you know, that was really kind of our next phase. I think the one thing that Oversee has, you know, I'll take ownership of it, is one thing that, that Oversee has traditionally been plagued with is the complaint of too many notifications or, or false notifications. Um, I think all remote monitoring products suffer from that issue but Oversee is the one that I can actually fix and, and address and, and look to make changes. Um, so going backwards, uh, the intent of the way that Oversee is supposed to work uh, for, for really from day one is that a device is supposed to be disconnected continuously for 15 minutes before we send a notification. We were not delivering on that, on that design. Uh, we were over notifying. We were allowing devices to connect and reconnect and sending over excessive notifications. Um, we were sending inaccurate notifications based on the way that our logic was working. Like, well, I'll take complete ownership of it. We had a problem and it lasted way too long. We got it fixed. So around November of last year, November of 2020, our team embarked on, on really building notifications from the ground up. Um, we, we talked to a lot of dealers. We realized what they wanted, what they needed, um, a lot of partners. Um, and really just said, what do we need to do? Let's, let's not try to fix what is, is broken. Let's just build it from the ground up because what we had, I don't think was the right solution to start with. So we really embarked on this, this create it from the ground up using much more modern technology, um, you know, from the, from the back end perspective and really just, just rethinking the logic of how things worked. Um, what that resulted in is the release that we pushed out Tuesday. Uh, I think when you guys all woke up Tuesday morning, it was there. Um, and since that time, we have now seen a 92% reduction in notifications. Uh, that's today's numbers. Uh, I assume that they're a little bit low because of the three-day weekend. However, uh, going into the weekend, we were at 85. So I would, I would su suggest and I would expect for us to settle out at really somewhere between an 80 and 85% reduction in, in notifications. We're even seeing that with larger um, oversee customers like Parasol. Um, so Parasol has a very large uh, dealer base and, and thousands of customer accounts that they're actively monitoring. Um, and to see what we have done for them and to see the numbers that they're, they're sharing with us of what it, what it's, how it's reduced their work has been amazing. So I'm really excited about it, but the release that we did on Monday was also not just a backend improvement about how we manage notifications. It's also some setting the stage for a lot of future things to, to come inside of Oversee. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen out here um, and, and, uh, and then we'll, get, we'll jump right into, uh, into what's changed and kind of walk through some of that stuff. Um, yeah, really quick, man. I, I, I love hearing your perspective and your hands on. That's really great. I can already see some questions, guys. Let's keep these coming. Um, 
Uh, Evan, let's let's get you rolling, and then as you kind of pause off, and let's answer questions as we go. Um, but it looks like our audience is already, you know, in tune with you and where you're going. So look forward to this. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. And and like I said, if if there's anything that comes up um, that that I need to be interrupted on, man, just jump in, and I'm I'm happy to to answer those questions. Um, so all right. So first things first. Uh, when you guys logged in, you'll notice man, it, it changed, right? Like my entire interface has changed. We used to have a static left-hand column uh, of customer lists over here. Um, we, have, we have now converted that to a full size page. The other thing that this has changed is you typically got the first customer in your alphabetical list. You got their location dashboard, which is really unnecessary. It was never the right job that you wanted to see. Um, so we just didn't, it, it distracted from what we were trying to do. When I open up Oversee, the first step that I need to do is I need to figure out my customer. Um, and we, we have done away with a lot of the things that detracted from that. The number, for, the number one and obvious thing was the, the location dashboard for the first customer in your list. You can see people doing things like this where, where they put spaces in front of it to elevate their account to the top or they use numbers to, to bring it up. And really, it's it's foolish to do that. I mean, I, I get it, that it's useful for, for specific accounts, but really the way that you guys use this product, um, the idea is that all this stuff should be should be alphabetical. Um, we So first things first, we improved the search. Uh, I don't know if this is a, a well-known fact or not, but in the map section in the old um, interface, you could search by location name. So I could put in something like beach, and I would return the customer information from Beach. Um, that was never in the customer search. So we brought this across forward. So now if I just type in the word home, I can, I can bring the home in and I can see all my locations with the word home in it. So we've brought that across. Um, and so that's kind of the idea. So starting with the search, and I'll expand on this more, uh, some of the other things that we've done in, inside of search. The next thing we did is we realized that a lot of our partners didn't have common ways to share customer contact information. And I know that sounds silly and outside of the, the overseas purview, but it is a major pain point of, of your guys's operation and really your guys's efficiency. What we saw is emails like, hey, call this guy or a text of here's the customer's email or here's the property manager's number, call them or whatever. Like, man, just give me their contact information. So the idea here is now I can click on here and I can open up my email from, from either the web or the mobile device, and I can send them an email if I need to send them an email, um, or I can, um, I can actually click on their, their phone number and call them. If I'm, on, if I'm using the Oversee app on my phone, man, I can call that customer straight away and I don't have to do anything more. So it's little tools like, we're, like this, little tricks that we're doing here to empower you guys to add efficiency to your day. Um, no more calling the office and be like, hey, I need so-and-so's phone number. Like, it's right here. Call it and get it and get in there. Um, it's, it's like I said, it's little things like that. The next thing that we did that, that I'll bring up here is now when you go into the customer uh, information, when you create a new customer, you guys are constantly seeing this page. Um, but there's a couple of new nuances that are available on this page. Number one is the time zone. Um, if you guys recall, the Oversee notifications were always generated in the UTC. So you guys, this time of year, had to take the notification and subtract eight hours uh, in order to figure out how many, you know, what time the actual event happened. So what we've done is we've put in the, the time zone inside of the, um, the account. So for all existing Oversee accounts, what you've done, what we've done is that if this thing has a verified address, so you'll see this little verified thing in here, um, if that has a verified address, we've gone ahead and set the time zone for your existing projects. You may go back and verify it. We have had a couple of, of issues where they didn't get set um, or it got set incorrectly. So there's some trickiness like uh, Arizona, for example, doesn't recognize uh, daylight savings time where right now that I think they're actually in um, in mountain time. So they, they landed in mountain time, not mountain, no daylight savings time. So Anyway, just ver just validate that on a few of your projects, but for the most part, if it had a verified address, um, it will have the time zone set. So that's the other one, or that's the, the time zone. The other thing that we added here was this, this concept of a job code. There's way too many times that we saw customer names and locations getting hijacked um, with, uh, with, you know, 
distracting information that really didn't help anybody. Like it, it gave me, you know, Parasol, I'll use Parasol as a great example. They put one asterisk for their basic uh, monitoring and they put two asterisks at the end of the customer name for those that are on, on a premium account or a proactive account. Um, like, why wouldn't we just introduce a job code? So it's just an open open text form field that, that'll hold 30 characters, 32, I think it's 30 characters, that's free for you guys to do with it what you want. The important of that, and I, or important part of that, like I said, I was gonna come back to search. So you saw that I put RMR diamond in there. So here I can actually filter now on job code. It doesn't show up here in the list because it doesn't really necessarily give us a whole lot of value. Um, and it's actually one of the things we're, we're looking at adding uh, based on some dealer feedback, but currently it's not there, but you can certainly search on it. So now if I have customers that are under warranty that I have a, a, a I, I really have an elevated service commitment to them right now, and I don't have the ability to, to, um, to bill from them, I'm going to put them into, into a warranty state. Um, if I have customers that are paying me an RMR or a monthly service fee, I want to, those are the people that are critically important to me. Um, we also have partners that have multiple locations. So here's the office in Virginia versus Maryland, or, or you know, for you guys, I'll, I'll use uh, in Long Beach and, and, uh, and, and LA or, or whatever you want to call it. it it's, it's however you guys can, can want to sort it out. But the point is, is that job code is, is there for you guys to use how you want. And it's also searchable both in the customer page as well as the notification page. So um, I'm gonna jump right down to notifications next. Notifications, we've done it. This looks probably completely different to everybody. We have done a number of things. Um, our notifications were really difficult to digest. Um, when we sent an email notification, you got a, um, an email that said, eight devices have been, have changed state. Four of them have been connected and three of, or yeah, four have connected and four are disconnected. And what we saw, we literally saw uh, people that were proactively trying to monitor their customer accounts, take that information and paste it into an Excel spreadsheet based on timestamp and trying to sort and figure out what the hell was going on with the customer, um, uh, with the system. And that was just ridiculous. So when we when we set out on this, it was like, well, I need to understand the, the device that was impacted and what the impact time was. So here's a here's an Amazon Blink camera that went down for five minutes at 9 a.m. today or yesterday. I can I can understand that. So if a customer calls me and says, hey, I didn't have video, I don't have video recording or whatever, I can at this time, I can now know that. That's because the camera was doing some sort of maintenance or something at, for five minutes. It didn't respond for five minutes on the network. Um, you know, I can I can come down here and look at this this printer. Um, so this is a, a KMC two fifty eight printer, Konica Minolta printer. This thing was offline for a couple of days. You know, two, uh, two days and five hours. So if they were unable to print, and I have to support that, I now know what was going on as that device has been offline. Um, we did that through this, this reference ID. Um, I bring that up because that's how we do it. I'll just kind of give you some inner workings of what, what we're doing here is effectively when a device goes into a down state, into disconnect, let's just use disconnected. Um, when a device goes in, goes disconnected, we generate a reference ID. And every event that happens against that device until it becomes connected is logged under that reference ID. So that's how we get this window of information. The other thing was that notification page didn't really give you any place to go. It wasn't actionable, um, right? You used to have to go, oh, so I have to go to this customer, this location. Then you had to come out here and then scroll down to that customer list and, and go into that and go find that device um, to get to the information. What we're doing here today is we just take this guy. This is the, the device we were just looking at. I can just go directly to the device and I've literally just traversed across oversee without having to go up and back down and drill back down. I've traversed across the application to get exactly where I wanted to go. The other thing that we, the next thing that we introduced in here is activities. Um, you've always had them for, for what we call 1P devices or oversee enabled devices. That would be things like Wattbox, um, cameras, Luma cameras, um, 
uh, access points, switches, routers, any of any of the devices that we make that that automatically connect to Oversee without the requirement of Oversee Pro, um, those devices have always had activity logs. However, we never exposed them for third-party devices. So again, here's that Konica Minolta um, printer. I can click on activities and I have a list of everything that that device is, has been going through. So here's my most recent, uh, he, this guy was part of our beta test, but here's our most recent uh, event. So you, again, this is exactly what was shown in the notification page, but I can see if this thing is connecting and disconnecting and going through an issue. Um, I've got some, some history here that I can go through and, and better understand that. So that's what, I, that's what we've got on the notifications page. Um, I'm going to actually pause right here and probably a, a really good time to answer some questions that may have come in. Uh, let me go through here real quick. Um, hey, you got them up, Jeffrey? With uh, yeah, you, Jeff, Jeffrey's got uh, two customer, two clients with full addresses, city zip, and and can't verify address. What do you do? Um, that's a really good question. So um, I assume, so this could certainly happen with like new builds, um, things that, that don't uh, necessarily, um, you know, new housing developments that don't, that aren't mapped yet. What we're using, I'll just kind of share some of the, the, the open the kimono a little bit. Um, we're just using Google's um, suggested search based on an address. Uh, and what that does is that creates latitude and longitude. Um, and that's how we establish the time zone. So if it doesn't have a verified address, it's not the end of the world. Um, just manually set the time zone would be the right thing to do um, until, that, until that gets picked up. Um, and, I'll, and Jeffrey, I'll take your information down or actually what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll give this uh, to the group, but there's another way. We see this actually in the UK as well. Um, and oh, and one other trick, uh, if you have apartments, uh, apartment numbers and floors or suite numbers, things like that, leave those out of the address because that will that will confuse that that uh, Google search. Um, so you may try that as well as is taking out any apartment numbers or suites or anything else that that may not be relevant to the latitude and longitude. Um, but I'll, I'll, there's some other tricks I can I can post here and, and share with you guys. Um, Need oversee home to jump to an offline mode when a customer's internet is down, um, but his network is fully functional. So um, Ted's Ted's question is about uh, you know basically what I what I what I'm interpreting to be. In, in offline mode, I actually, I want to pause there for a second and talk about offline mode or offline online versus connect and disconnect. And I think this is just kind of an opportunity for us to, to clear the air and, and make sure we understand we're all on the same page. Inside of Oversee, we use the term uh, connect and disconnect um, instead of online and offline. We do that very intentionally because by no means are we suggesting that we know that the device is offline and not functioning. What we're saying by the term disconnect is that we have no visibility into the device. And again, this is bigger than oversee. This is really any, any um, product that's out there. We just don't have visibility to it. It could be uh, online and functioning. Uh, we just don't have visibility into it. And I'll, I'll touch on that one here in a second. Um, so anyway, so when it's disconnected, we don't have the ability. So it's, it, it's no longer talking to our servers which means we no longer have the ability to issue a reset or reboot command to that device because that's our, that's our tunnel of communication is between the device and our servers. And so when that, is, is, when that tunnel is down, I can't do anything from the remote capability side of things. And that's what we're trying to, that, that's what that's addressing. So um, I'm gonna stop there for a second and I'm gonna jump right into kind of what one of the next new features is that we introduced here um, because it, it, it really is relevant to this, this statement. But effectively, um, I don't have this capability inside of, to answer your, your question directly, Ted, is that I don't have the ability to do this inside of Oversee Home today. Um, 
And it's mostly because I don't have a direct connection to that device. Now, as a dealer, uh, as a partner, what we have done and, and an overseas user, we have now introduced this limited state. I don't know if you guys have noticed this yellow tile that has appeared on your sites. Um, limited state is something I'm really excited about going forward in the future. And that is basically the device is there in some capacity, but it's not working as fully expected. Uh, so I'll talk about what we released with and kind of some future, future capabilities that we're looking at. So the product, the, the feature that we released limited with is when you have overseas enabled devices, I'll use a watt box, for example, um, that device connects directly to the overseas servers without the use of an overseas pro device. Now, if I have a watt box with an Arachnus router or an overseas hub or a control four controller or a package router, um, I now have an overseas pro enabled device along with that overseas enabled device. So what the overseas pro device is doing is it's scanning the entire network and reporting the status of all the devices that it sees on the network. Now, limited state says that you have a device that has that is not connecting to our servers, but we see it on the local network. Um, so that means so the the scenario, the use case there is you've got a customer that comes that or you get a notification that in the old days, prior to last week, the old days, prior to last week, um, you would say, you get a notification that the, the Control 4 controller is offline and it wasn't your pro device. You have an Arachnus router as your pro device. Um, it's offline, but you opened up Composer and you remote it into the device. So clearly Oversee is wrong and, and Oversee is terrible. Well, that's not the case because what's actually happening is the controller wasn't talking to the server but the router found it. The router saw it on the local area network. So in order to resolve issues like that, what we recommend is actually just rebooting the device to reestablish that connection to our servers, and that will bring it back online. And then that will allow us to, to get that tunnel reestablished to perform any kind of maintenance. And the question that you would say is, well, if it's, if it's offline or if it's, if, if it's not there in a limited state, how would we do it? With the Oversee Pro device in, in a house, Web Connect still works. When a device is in the limited state, the Web Connect continues to work. So I can log into the local UI and issue a reboot command through that local device without, have, without the dependency of, of the Oversee connection. I, I hope that makes sense. Um, but that was the idea behind limited. So when we go back to this, um, to kind of what, what's going on and really what the capabilities are with limited, out of the box, it basically, when a device is, is now connected, that means that both methods of communication are established with our overseas servers. The pro device sees it and it's talking directly to our servers. A disconnected state says that both methods, and again, this is only for overseas enabled devices, um, both methods of communication are, are, are gone, meaning the overseas pro device cannot see it and it's not talking to our servers. The limited state is the state in between that says it's not talking to our servers, but the pro device sees it online. That's what limited means. That's how, how it gets there. Um, in order to take action, what we would do, what we would recommend doing is using the Web Connect tool to get in and reboot that device to reestablish that connection. Um, and I know that's, that's not ideal. We will build on this going forward, but I wanted to get it out in front of you guys because today... Or, or I should say last week when a device lost its connection, regardless of the pro device being present, it was disconnected. There was nothing you could do. So we're expanding this and we're trying to give you more information. Now, going forward, we look at, at giving you more information and, and expanding the capability around limited. So one of the features that was recently introduced to the Wattbox 800 series is over current protection. We tell you when you're drawing too much power um, from the device, the outlet actually will turn off. The impacted outlet will actually shut off. Um, and so we've had dealers say, well, wait a minute, like outlet nine is turned off on this thing. Why is that outlet nine off? The rest of it seems to be working fine. It's because the device has got into an overcurrent protection. This is actually what the latest firmware release that came out a couple of weeks ago was addressing. Um, so what we're doing now is we're putting that into a limited state. This is going to be coming in the next couple of sprints or the next couple of weeks for you guys. Um, 
is we're now going to tell you that you're going to see the device is in a limited state. And when you hover over the, the yellow diamond, it'll tell you that the device is in overcurrent protection. It happens immediately because we know that you're on site and you've plugged it in and you and we want to catch you before you leave the site. So that one's going to be very quick. Um, so that's one. That's probably the next example that you'll see. Some of the other things that I'm looking at is I can put devices in a limited state for like a CA10. Uh, CA10 is a, our big beefy control four processor that's got failover hard drives, failover power supplies, failover network um, uh, cards, failover cooling fans. All of those devices are intended to fail without impacting the performance of the system. However, the, the partner has to go through and do custom programming today in order to receive email notifications that those things have happened. We're going to incorporate that logic inside of control, inside of Oversee, so that if a CA10's hard drive fails, we'll put it into a limited capacity and we'll tell you that the hard drive has failed so that you can start to work on an RMA process uh, and get that thing up and running while it continues to work for your customer. So basically that gives you some lead time so that you can get replacement parts and again, only visit the customer's system once or the site once. Um, I'm going to jump back into some some uh, questions here, and unless you've got anything uh, else that you want to jump in on. Sorry. Uh, no worries. So Oversee mode, uh, Oversee is, is obviously this normally needs your cloud. However, uh, you can find a way to store uh, enough in the 310 to handle this request. Oh, to do on and offline uh, notifications. So basically switch to an on-premise uh, notification. It's not a bad idea. It's one that we've kicked around, uh, especially with the Control 4, uh, the introduction of the Control 4 controllers coming into being Oversee enabled. Um, looking to the on-premise uh, capability, that's it's really a good idea. It's one that we've kicked around, but it, it technically it requires a significant amount of work uh, in changing the way that our app is built to, to look to between on-prem and off-prem uh, or uh, on-prem versus cloud. So um, it's, it's an idea that we've kicked around. Um, so Stan Clark is complaining, he's not getting any notifications. Uh, let's go through that. I mean, that's, I, I, I say that because I like to hear that. To me, that's, that's music to my ears. I know that sounds terrible, but uh, it's way better than telling me that I'm getting way too many notifications. So there's a couple of things to check if you're not getting notifications. Number one, we have a monitoring bell over here. So at the customer level, make sure that that monitoring bell is enabled there. You can see I have a number of them disabled. Um, make sure the monitoring bell is on there. The next thing that you'll wanna check is, um, is at the device level. We've got the monitoring bells here for all the devices. By default, Oversee enabled devices have their monitoring bell turned on. And Oversee Pro devices, all these devices with the Pro icon, have those monitoring bells turned off. You can then go back and turn on notification bells for third-party devices uh, as, you, as you want. So um, that's kind of where that sits. Oh, and then the third place is, is if you go to the user settings, uh, this is per user. So when I do it at the customer level, that's for the, for the, the customer and the device level, and every user would follow those within your company. And then at the user level, you need to make sure that you have uh, notifications enabled and then choose which ones you want. Do you want to get push notifications? Do you want to get them via email? Uh, do you want to receive connect, disconnect, or limited notifications? By default, this is turned off because we didn't want to turn on any uh, extra notifications for you guys whatsoever. Um, creating custom TCP tunnels for other applications. Let's go through that one real quick because you can do that today. It happens actually at the site level. Uh, so I'll use a, a, a Crestron. So I, I used to be a, a Crestron certified programmer. Um, I'm just gonna go in here and, and we'll just actually, not that guy. Um, we'll come in here at the site level. So I go into my customer and then I go to site settings and I do network port scanned. So again, let's just make sure, let's say that this is a, um, a, a Crestron system. And for Crestron, uh, you'll use port 41795 in order to connect, uh, to use toolbox um, to connect to devices. Uh, so I would come in here and I, and I would just add 41795. Of, well, actually I would label this um, 
and I would put this in at uh, 41795. And then as soon as I save that, now I've done this and I can go back to my location and do a scan. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna go out and scan the entire network for port 41795 being open um, so that we can, uh, we can, you can generate that link, that web connect link and put that into toolbox. You can do the same thing with um, remote desktop, um, or if you're a Savant dealer, Savant uses uh, VNC, which I believe is 59, port 5900. Um, you know, I, it, it's really funny working, working inside this company, like, and I, I think it's probably the same with, with kind of our, our uh, local distribution customers. Like, I'm far more agnostic uh, than, than a lot. Like, I know we work with Control 4 and we sell Control 4, but I'm also representing you guys as, as dealers who make decisions that are best for your business and best for your customer. And I'm not going to prescribe how things work or don't work. So I'm, I always try to be knowledgeable about how other, other products work, even if they are competitors. So, you know, using a Savant system, you still use Oversee. I want you guys inside using Oversee because there is tremendous value that we'll deliver. Um, but you just need to do things like that of, of setting up site settings for, um, for those kind of custom settings. So, that's where you'll get to that uh, in there. Um, let's see what else we got. Any, any thought to add description field uh, to each device to identify floor location, similar to domotes? Um, yeah, so uh, the, the question is, is adding um, more description fields like zone. I think domotes has, has zone, they have room and zone um, in there. Uh, you know, yes, the, the, the answer is yes. Um, you, will, you will see some additional uh, fields from us um, that are coming into Oversee in the, in the not too distant future. Um, we're looking at things like room uh, and category. Unfortunately, like, it's actually really funny. My, my uh, peers make fun of me because my device naming conventions are, um, I'm very, very specific about my um, naming conventions, right? Like I have a category, I have the manufacturer, I have the model, and then I have the location. Um, that's just the way I've named my device. I've, I've done this for, for years um, because it's, it's critically important to me. I, I get frustrated when I see things like WAP or PDU uh, or WAPBOX. Like that doesn't do anybody any good. WAPBOX is actually a step forward. I at least know what, what the, the manufacturer is. Um, where this is giving me the information that I want, that I expect to see and how I should, should see that device once I click on it. Um, so we're looking at adding that uh, kind of capabilities, specifically room and category will be coming. Um, so just look for that. Um, all right, Oversee app fully updated now. Is there an option to not only have Oversee Home but possibly oversee business and commercial accounts? Yeah, so that's a great question um, around oversee home. Um, so we have, we have multiple flavors of, of oversee. We have um, oversee, which is really designed for, for you, our partners to use for configuration and monitoring the devices. Today, we have an oversee home app um, that is currently getting worked on and, and, and done. And when it, that relaunches, it will come out with a new name um, that replaces the word home because uh, we realize there's commercial use of our products uh, and oversee home is kind of a disqualifier or a detractor for some of these, these commercial accounts um, or businesses are like, I don't want to use a home product. So yeah, you'll see that thing getting renamed. Um, the acknowledge box cannot be clicked to clear once uh, the first ones are, uh, yeah. So let's go through acknowledged. Uh, so that question around here is the acknowledge box here. Um, and I've already cleared my accounts out. Let me jump in, see if I can go to another account here. And we'll see what we get on a different one. Let's go to demo. Uh, all right, so if I go to notifications, oh, look, they're disabled. Um, that's not a good one either. And what else do I have here? Uh, let's use this guy. Okay, so if I go to my notifications, and this is a this is a large customer, but um, you'll see these blue dots here are an indication of new events. So let's kind of break this this page down. 
blue dots here are unacknowledged notifications. So even if I go to a different page and come back without acknowledging these, um, these blue dots will persist. So we did this because we, we realized that we we're effectively giving you a, a mail in email box, uh, email inbox with no ability to manage it, understand what was new or old in the old method. So here we've at least put in these blue dots of what's there. You then have the ability to acknowledge it. So if I just wanted to take this guy um, and acknowledge it, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a big account, but anyway, I can put a check box on this one. Um, this, this is a customer that's got thousands, but anyway, so I can click on that. Um, and then once I acknowledge it, you'll see that blue dot disappear. Um, the, the acknowledge, basically this checkbox is to effectively just remove that, the blue dot. It's not going to sit there. These notifications will persist for 14 days. It's a running 14 day total. So they'll always be in here for 14 days. If you need to go further back than that, then click on go to the device details and that will take you to uh, what you need to uh, gain access to. Uh, hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Um, uh, oh. Are you looking at Ted's question there? Yeah. Have you read through that? Uh, just that it, he might have wanted to kind of re-appropriate uh, his question being offline, but um, but no. But we can keep rolling. I mean, let, let's get let's take care of Ted. About the three ten router. Okay. Uh, tested two browsers. Uh, cannot clear notifications. Um, Jay, I think I'd, I'd take that one offline. I'll give you guys my email address here too. I'm happy to to work through the through any issues that you guys are having. Um, one thing that I would say on that regard is, you know, so so basically, Jay saying that there's an issue with multiple browsers not being able to clear notifications. Uh, I'll look at this and and we'll figure it out. But effectively, um, that one we we recommend using uh, Google Chrome browser. Um, as, as really our, our defined um, uh, supported browser. I mean, we'll, we work to make sure they all work. Uh, however, we have found that Chrome is the one that's typically used. Uh, if you are using Microsoft Edge, just make sure it's a newer version of Microsoft Edge that's Chromium based and, and you should have the exact same experience. Um, but we do also test with Safari and uh, Firefox uh, as well. But if there's um, if there's any recommended browser that I would say to use, it would be Chrome or, uh, you know, Chromium based browsers. Um, one other thing I wanted to pull up and that was our, um, our notifications. Um, and I want to pull up a, uh, a, one of, one of the sample, uh, notifications that we, we get here. Um, one of the things that I did when we look to sending notifications, email notifications out the door, um, I really had this concept of, I want to, uh, there, there's a couple of things we did. Number one, we got customer feedback that says that one email that has both connects and disconnects in the same email was very confusing and difficult to understand what was going on. I think I alluded to that earlier. Um, another statement is, so, so to address that, we basically have separated notifications. You will only get a notification that contains either connects, disconnects, or limited events. We will not intermix the, the, the three event types in a single email. So uh, you'll only receive a connect, you'll only receive a disconnect. You will not see multiple types of events in a single email. Secondarily is I wanted it to say, I wanted it to be that I should only have to look at the most recent email for that customer. And that's as, all, that's as far as I should ever have to go. Um, the idea here is that, so here's my customer. And I'll just kind of walk through this. So here's my customer uh, and location. Here's the time of the notification. Here is the newly affected device. So we have that Blink camera that we looked at earlier, came online. And he has no other monitor devices that are currently offline. So he, this was the only thing. And it looks like his site is fully healthy with this email. Uh, I'm going to scroll through here and find some other emails real quick. Um, but it's but the idea is that I shouldn't have to go digging. It's it, like it shouldn't become a math problem to to figure out what's going on in these homes uh, or in these in these systems. It should just it should just be simple. Um, and so I am 
sorry about this. I'm just trying to find one that has multiple events. Okay, so like here's one that has has a couple of devices that disconnected. So here you've got a touch panel and a, like a T4 uh, touch panel and a T3 touch panel that both disconnected. I was doing an update on that one. Um, and I just want one that's got a number of, ah, here's a great one. So here's one that shows, um, you know, here's the customer uh, coming back online, you can see their parasol customers with the double check. Um, this is the event or the device that, for whatever reason, they were um, monitoring a, a uh, iPad. But here's the other devices that were offline. So you can see, like, this device has been offline since August 12th, August 12th, May 18th, September 7th, and September 1st. So we're telling you, like, hey, look, you've got five other devices. Like, this device just came back online but there's five other devices that continue to be offline. Um, so again, in one email, I now understand this the condition of this customer's location and what I need to do. Um, so that's the idea is that, that one email should for, for that customer should answer any questions or intentions of what we're doing. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, the one I, that's the last part I, I wanted to cover on that. Um, that's really, that's, uh, that's a lot of information, I think, as far as what this new release is. I think we just spend the, the remaining 10 minutes and kind of go through these questions. Yeah, um, I agree. I wanted you to be, to be able to present anything, you know, out of the yep. box for everybody. But yeah, let's get through these questions. This has been extremely informative, Evan. It really, getting your perspective has been awesome. I mean, I've done these a lot, and um, this isn't almost a customer presentation as it is a tech-to-tech -tech kind of uh, view of your screen. I really appreciate it. So yeah, let's get through these questions. We've got another, like, a little over 10 minutes. We'll stay on board with everybody to get your questions answered. But awesome job so far, bud. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so, so uh, Stan Clark, your your question about adding a first scene time and a last scene time, that's actually, I, I sorry about that, I didn't mean to, to stop sharing the screen here. Um, that's actually available in the device details. Um, so what we'll do, I'll just come in here and grab a device. Uh, if you expand out your device details, you can see the, the, um, the, the first scene. So this thing came on January 25th and it was last seen. Um, you know, so these things are all in there. Um, we have that in there. It's just not in the notification data. But once you click on go to device, that can that will take you uh, directly there. You can see the the activity log and then go to the device details. So we do have that information readily available today. Uh, yeah. Add more macro options for oversee home app for clients. Um, <laughs> I think. Yeah, that's a, a, another great question. So the question is, should we add, can we add more macro options for Oversee Home uh, users? And the answer is yes. Um, I just actually was in a demo before this, this webinar of us uh, adding discrete power commands. I think that's what been one of our most commonly requested features for Oversee Home uh, is to get, uh, to get discrete power. So give the customer the ability to turn off devices or on devices instead of just rebooting them. Um, so I just sat through a demo with my developer development team um, and, and they're showing it. So we've got to get some, some bugs worked out and, uh, and some beta testing working and, and we'll get that out to you guys here uh, quickly. Um, can we, so Joe uh, Hilbert, uh, can we monitor uh, network devices on a separate networking scheme. So basically different subnets and VLANs and things like that. The answer is yes. Um, and it really depends on the action that you take depends on the device that you're on. So uh, I say yes with an asterisk. Um, in today's world, I'll put this on there. I'll talk about a couple of things that are on my screen that are not on your screens today, um, or I guess one of them. Um, 
the 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 one that's here is so I go into VLAN settings. This is where I add different VLAN. So in my house, I have a MoIP system that's running on VLAN 20. So I've gone ahead and added that VLAN. I have to give it a static IP. Uh, basically, the hub has to. So I'm using the Oversea Pro hub. Uh, in this instance, the hub has to have a physical presence on that subnet. So this is where I create that IP address for it. So this is 20.5, and then I give it the subnet mask. And now that hub has a presence on, I have to obviously configure my switches to, have, to be on trunk ports. So the, the port that the hub plugs into is on a trunk port of the switch um, and, and all of that. But once you do that, you can sit here and add any number of VLANs that you want, um, as long as as long as the, the hub has access to those subnets, then you can monitor them without issue. Um, now, the caveats I said about specific devices, if I have an Arachnus router uh, or a package router as my Oversea Pro host, uh, by default, it has the ability to scan across all the VLANs on the network. There's no configuration necessary. If I'm using an Oversea Pro hub or a package NK1, um, those devices will need this uh, manual entry like this, um, like what I've done here. Um, and then control for controllers operating as a Oversea Pro host uh, currently do not support subnet, uh, scan scanning across different subnets. Uh, however, that is an improvement that's coming with our Oversea Pro update uh, version 6.3.0 that we should probably see sometime in October. Um, but so we're, we're looking to add that for the control for controllers, but that's the only one that is incapable of, of scanning across uh, subnets today. So I think we, uh, we answered that guy, create user defined custom TCP tunnels for other applications. I went through that one. Um, Firefox, Jay's using Firefox and not able to clear notifications. I'll go back and do some testing. Uh, I'll file a bug on that and we'll we'll get that one uh, addressed for you guys. Uh, any equipment ex, ex, oh, uh, expiration timeline reminders like a Hiji. Um, so a Hiji we used to have, um, basically, I, I believe you're talking about uh, uh, scheduled downtime. Uh, basically, if you guys are going into a house and you're gonna be working on a house, instead of sitting there sending you notifications uh, repeatedly of the device being disconnected or whatever, and then reconnected and, and back and forth as you're doing service in a house, Aheji had the ability to kind of block the notifications from being sent during a time window. Um, and we don't have that really in here. The difference, the reason we're not doing that is within Aheji, um, we would continue to send you notifications um, repeatedly until that device came back online. Really the approach to Aheji was was more of that MSP level of monitoring, like, hey, that device is still offline. Six hours later, you get, hey, that device is still offline. Because we only notify once on the disconnect and once on the reconnect, that became lesser of a priority um, for us uh, to, to put into Oversee. But there are things that we're looking to do with a Hiji or that we have in a Hiji that we will bring across. Um, one thing I do also want to take, I know we're short on time, but I, one thing I do want to talk about here is backpack migration. So anybody who is a, a package uh, user, we are in the process of, of shutting down backpack. So all package firmware that is going to be supported or all package devices that are gonna be supported uh, with Oversee directly, uh, all that firmware is completed and done. Um, if you have package or if you have package products uh, and need to do an update, I would recommend doing that. Once you get that done, you can actually migrate the data so you don't have to recreate your site, your account in Oversee. Uh, you, can, you can claim the device in Oversee, scan the network, and then run a, a, a migration. And that will go look, you'll have to put your user credentials in here. Um, and once you put your user credentials in Oversee, you can go then go into the site settings and migrate the data from backpack into here. So we'll do a Mac address comparison, and we'll take the, the named, the, the device name in backpack and overwrite that inside of Oversee. So you guys don't have to recreate that. We're also in process of, so our goal is to shut backpack down by the end of the year. Uh, that's the reason I bring that up. Um, and then Envision, we're in process of doing that. That will probably, we'll be looking to shut that down shortly after the first of the year. 
Um, but the Envision devices, if you guys are Heji customers, um, reach out to your sales rep or whatever, um, and we'll we'll get you guys. We'll we'll show you how this stuff works. But the idea there is the existing hardware generally. Uh, will be able to be switched or converted to overseas devices uh, without a truck roll, without a site visit, um, and we can get you transitioned over. Uh, so that's that's exciting news and, and something I've been waiting for for a, a number of years. Um, can we use the RK1 as the overseas pro device and remove an existing overseas uh, overseas 300 pro hub? Absolutely. Um, all you have to do is your hub pro should of of established the RK1 and, and claimed it automatically. All you'd have to do, uh, Daniel, is come into this page and hit the drop down and choose the RK1, for example. I, here I use the NK1 because actually my RK1 is up higher. Uh, so you just choose the RK1 and you can use it for the speed test or the, um, or the network scan or both, whichever you want to do. Um, job has an RK1 that was recently updated to be seen by Oversee. Would like to remove this. Okay, that's great. That's done. Um, may have been dressed. Uh, so searching for MAC addresses, we don't have that currently enabled as a feature. Um, we are looking at, at uh, expanding our search capabilities dramatically. Um, is one like really introducing a, a true global search um, is something that will be coming on our roadmap, but is not available today. Uh, right. If the Arachnus routers are limited to a speed test, which products have you seen with best testing results? Uh, really, um, I think honestly, the, the best testing results are, are the Oversea Pro. Uh, Hub is phenomenal. Um, the Control 4 controllers have been also phenomenal. Um, the package, like for my personal experience in my house with my ISP, it's, you'll see things vary by ISP. Um, the package routers have, have yielded around a, a seven to 800 uh, speed test result for me personally. Um, so they're a little bit lower, but with the Oversea Hub and with the Control 4 controllers, uh, I've been getting, you know, between 940, uh, between 930 and 950 on, on my system. So I need to change my audio over because apparently my headset's going to die. Um, all right. So it looks like I switched over successfully. We yeah, can, we can hear you. A little, little uh, echoey, but no, let's go. keep going. As you see, we keep getting questions oh, in here, let guys. Let me switch my audio over. Uh, but we uh, do hear you. You okay? Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. Um, all right, what's the timeline for the next gen router? I don't have any visibility on that right now. Um, that is, uh, that's not my purview. So I, I know they're, they're working on it, but it's, um, it, it's, it's sometime in the future. Uh, speed test from the 310 router. My question is not about max test speed. It's about showing very low speeds and mix between very high speeds, but testing um, outside of the 310 shows the same suits. Okay, I got it, Ted. Um, so that one, there's also, so there's some logic and this is on us to improve. Um, there's some automated uh, selection of speed test servers uh, that happens inside of Oversea when you guys run a speed test. Uh, we, we're basically choosing the closest device um, based on response time and mileage, which may not be the, the best deal. What we've seen typically when you see this, this up and down, like this up and down is me switching uh, pro devices, overseas pro devices. Um, but what we've seen where you get these sporadic um, swings in performance, you'll see it's, it's hitting a different uh, speed test server, which we don't expose in here. And that's something we're looking to improve. Um, it's also things that we see like with cable uh, connections, internet service providers, um, because that's a shared pipe, uh, your speed test performances will vary based on usage. Um, you know, like 7 p.m. in a residential uh, neighborhood of and having Comcast or whatever as your, as your uh, ISP that's high usage, so the band, so the pipeline is very full. So you'll you'll typically see slower speed test results at that time. 
Um, but primarily the main reason is, is switching between speed test servers uh, automatically and not indicating it. So that's something that we'll look to improve. Do you recommend setting C4 controllers, modems, routers uh, be set up to schedule reboots? If so, how often? Um, <laughs> my, my personal stance on this is, and I'll, I'll be very clear, this is my personal stance, automatic reboots are not a fix. It is simply a Band-Aid to an existing problem. Um, and, and trying to figure out what that problem is, is, is paramount to long-term uh, performance of the system. Um, control for controllers, I can speak to. There is no reason to reboot a control for controller. If, if you're having issues with that, I would recommend um, working with support to identify what those problems are and why that is, because I, I can tell you, you know, most of these systems are, are not requiring a reboot. Uh, if they're on current version of OS um, and they're up to, you know, a lot of times, a lot of the problems that we see actually with Control 4 controllers are they're running older versions of OS and fixes have been put in place to address those problems. And we just haven't seen it, but, or, or, and they just haven't been updated. So I would, my first statement is make sure you're up to date on the most current OS. Uh, and then secondarily, um, work with support to identify whatever the cause is or, or you know, whatever the issues are. And they can do that by getting um, the, the logs out of the devices and understanding where those are. But the, you know, if you have to reboot devices, something is not right uh, in general. Uh, now I will say there are things like Apple TVs. There are things like even my cable modem. Um, I, I reboot that thing like once a month because I'll see my speed test starting to decline. Um, and I just reboot the modem, not my router, not my switches or anything else, just that modem and that somehow miraculously brings it back up. Um, and that's not much I can do about that uh, just as a user. But I, like, I really don't like automated reboot. I don't like automated uh, taking action against the system automated, my personal perspective, um, because it, a lot of times I've seen it introduce more problems than, than it's working to resolve. But again, that's my personal stance as an integrator. Like I, that was the way I sit. I know that there are a lot of dealers that that adamantly disagree with that stance, and that's fine. I'm just saying my my stance on that is fine. Do what's best for your business. Do what's best for what you guys have service capacity for, and what your customers are ultimately looking for. So uh, I, I'm not going to tell you one way or the other, but I, I that's my stance of way the way I would address it. Uh, when we get the ability to manually add non oversee device, can we add uh, custom MIB monitoring? <laughs> Both great questions. So non oversee devices, if you have, um, if you're running oversee pro, non oversee devices will obviously be picked up. Um, and so that's really where you look at that oversee pro is really the competitive to competitor to what Domotes is or what a Hiji is. Um, or even what Backpack is, that's Oversea Pro is the comparable product to those things. So in all of those things, any IP connected device can be added and monitored to the system. Non-connected devices, uh, however, are not something that you can add in Oversea, but you can do it inside of, you can have these dummy devices in Aiji and, and other ways of doing that. It's something that we're looking at doing. Uh, like I said, we're looking at adding a lot of some of the Aiji Features, both of those things are Ahiji features that we will look to bring into Oversee at some point. I just don't have a timeline to discuss right now. Um, and then, uh, so Daniel, yeah, once you once you get the RK1 claimed inside of that Oversee account, you can pull. Um, what I would do is I would actually delete the Oversee hub. Don't just unplug it, um, delete it first. And then, uh, oh, actually, let me back up. Make sure that the RK1, so if you're going to switch hubs and, and replace this, um, choose the new hub or the new pro device, I should say. Um, choose a new pro device, do a network scan. Once that network scan has completed, go to the device details of, in this case, the 300 Pro, uh, delete the 300 Pro. That basically unclaims it from overseas. So when you take it to the next job, it's ready to, ready to be um, done. Um, and so, yeah, once you do that, then you're, you're off and running. Um, and is there any benefit to keeping the 300 Pro if we make the RK1? Um, again, I like you guys saw my system. Uh, I have I have seven or eight uh, Oversea Pro enabled devices in my system. It's really just really good testing. Uh, you know, I use that use case where we had a bad 
uh, wire on an EA3 in a theater. Um, it's just more data points. So uh, if you have customers that, that if the budget is there and the utility is there, I would say leave it. Um, I don't know, you know, it, it's, not, it's not critical or paramount to doing it, um, but it does give you just some added visibility of things. And if a device goes offline, like I've had a hub fail, I've had an EA1 get unplugged, I've had these things. So by having a single pro device in your system, you've introduced a single point of failure. So um, if you're trying to navigate through, use Web Connect and your pro device is offline, well, if you have another one, like I have, I have three controllers, four controllers in my house. Um, so if the CA10, let's say that, well, let's use my Zigbee server. Uh, if that's what I have running my Oversea Pro agent um, and that thing goes offline for whatever, I don't want to lose visibility or, or activity to my house. I just want to choose another path so I can switch it off of the, the Zigbee server over the CA10 or my RK1. And now I have a direct path to go in and get Web Connect and try to recover those devices. So it's just more tools, more utilities to help you guys be successful and really ultimately preventing that truck roll. That's what we're trying to do.